Ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening. I'm privileged and honored to be joined by Lieutenant General Sayadat Ahasan for a conversation on the Prime Minister's recent trip to Europe and its outcomes. That is what we are going to be discussing. General Hasan, sir, thank you so much. Namaste. Jai Hind, Jai Hind to you and Jai Hind to all our viewers. Jai Hind, sir. I hope you are having a very good evening. Absolutely, I'm looking forward to all your very very sharp questions. I know. Thank you, sir. First of all, let me begin by asking you: What is the strategic importance of Prime Minister Modi's visit to Europe? And especially, I'm also curious about the timing of it, especially because the Ukraine war is currently undergoing on the way, and we know how important Russia is to us. So, how do you make a sense of whatever is happening? See what is actually happening in the world today is a geopolitical shift, and this has been brought on by the events primarily of the last two years. Uh, let's start with the pandemic, which is still not ended, and it had a profound effect on the economies of the world, major major advanced economies too, on India itself. Although we are very fortunate, I think our management has been fairly good. We are emerging out of it. Uh, then we also had uh, the, two years ago uh, the Chinese uh, aggressive stance on Ladakh, an attempt to use wolf warrior kind of strategy against us. Thereafter, uh, Afghanistan in 2021, the withdrawal of the United States, changing the general structure of uh, of politics, geopolitics um, in the Central Asian, South Asian region to a great extent. The Middle East has been quiet. The Indo-Pacific has been reasonably quiet. Suddenly out of the blue in the month of February, you have found Ukraine coming up as a war. So as a result, uh, these are three or four churnings which have happened in the last two years, which have led to an emerging, uh, I won't say it's a new world order, but it's an emerging changes in the world order which are becoming evident. It will take a fair amount of time for it to finally emerge. In the middle of that, it's important for India to look for its options. There is no doubt we've got a very strong strategic relationship developing uh, with the United States. Uh, trust has enhanced tremendously. We've got a good old working relationship with Russia, which is not as profound as it was in the very, very past uh, in terms of uh, the Indo-Soviet um, uh, treaty of 20-year treaty, which was signed in 1971. And um, we, have, uh, we have got our differences with China, the third big power. We have our differences with them. We've got our territorial problems with them. Europe is a country, is, is, a, is a region which contributes to the multipolarity of the world. You see, if you see these countries individually, Germany, France, uh, the UK, etc., they all are essentially middle parts. But when you see this as a combined entity, the European Union is definitely a big part. So when you see all this, you realize that it's important to maintain your relationships. You're not seeking war with anyone. You're not seeking anything else. You are looking essentially at stable, good convergence of your interests, the sustenance of democracy and your values, right? Science and technology, which is something which you can't do without, energy security, and uh, things of this nature. So therefore, while India's relationship with the United States is strong, it's uh, with the Russia. It is well okay, um, progressing well, and we are uh, we are continuing our good relations with China. Uh, a downturn geopolitically, geostrategically, not so much economically. Economically, the, the the relationship has actually enhanced. We are ultimately looking at the last big part. This this particular uh, pole, which is Europe to see how much more can this relationship develop. I think Europe is a very, is an important entity whose worth has not really arrived at India's doorstep. We have exploited our relationships individually to a great extent, but somehow as a body, the relationship continues to remain quite transactional. 
but has all the scope to be actually transformational. You mentioned that, you know, most of these relationships have been transactional and bilateral in nature. And I think one of the best examples for that is of France, because France has been a very, very important strategic partner for us. And what does President Macron's re-election mean to India and the future of France as a cooperating strategic power with India uh, vis-a-vis China and both the Indian Ocean region, sir? See, the very fact that uh, during Prime Minister's visit to Europe, the program initially did not include France. Everything was waiting for the result of the elections in France. The moment it was declared that President Macron has uh, won, the the, the visit was was immediately put through, and uh, Mr. Modi stopped uh, for a day there and met President Macron. Our relationship, no doubt, I can tell you, and what you say, our relationship with France has been very, very strong. Uh, lots and lots of convergence of interests, particularly when it comes to aspects of technology. Uh, France is a powerhouse, absolutely, as far as uh, as far as far uh, manufacturing, defense manufacturing is concerned. And we have relied upon France to a very great extent. Uh, for our own uh, defense needs, other technologies. Besides that, overall trade with France, France is a $2.5 trillion economy, and therefore, obviously, with an economy that large, trade will always be uh, something which is uh, sustainable. But the most important thing is the geopolitical aspect. And there seems to be considerable uh, convergence of our interests in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, while the European Union as an entity has had a strong relationship, economic relationship with China, on the geopolitical side, individually these countries are not pursuing anything very, very great in terms of relationships with China because they're always suspicious. First of all, they are very largely on a security, uh, insecurity matters very largely under the umbrella of the United States. So therefore, their thinking is also colored accordingly. But largely in their own interest, they realize that China uh, and its ambitions, its aim of uh, being the world's only superpower, looking at 2049, etc., is not in the interest of international security. And therefore, I think uh, we are there's a commonality in Indian perception about China, uh, and uh, in the, as far as France's uh, uh, perception is concerned, and therefore. These perceptions converge. And uh, beyond, besides that, there's a very strong personal relationship which has been developed by Prime Minister Narendra Modi with uh, President Emmanuel Macron. And uh, I think that is actually also driving uh, the, all the energy which is uh, being involved in this, in this uh, progressing relationship. After President Putin announced or rather declared a war against Ukraine, uh, several leaders visited India, especially from Europe. I think almost eight European leaders had visited India while the West was rallying for support, especially from you know strong powers like India. So is it possible that this visit may have been as a result of uh, you know these efforts that have been put by the European leaders over the last few weeks? There are a considerable number of reasons, I think, for this uh, interest uh, which was triggered off uh, in India and its stance. It's not only about uh, Ukraine. Let me start by saying once again that all these countries are also geopolitically, geostrategically re-examining all their security options, right, relationships, economic relationships. All this is being reviewed. This inevitably happens when you have a churning which takes place uh, in in world affairs. And as I just explained to you, the last two years has seen a churning in international affairs. As a result, there's a review going on. World leaders wanted to come to India to understand India's position, uh, emerging importance, the state of the economy, what our overall stance is. These things are done uh, through talks far better than uh, just through diplomatic uh, niceties which take place in terms of ambassadorial uh, consultations and things like that. So I think most of the nations in Europe were particularly interested to know more about India 
India's uh, approach to the Pacific, the future of the, of the manner in which the strategic relationship with the United States is going, and coincidentally, perhaps it was triggered by this also by the fact that India had this unique position of taking a no position on the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, mm -hmm. taking what is called a, a position of of informed neutrality, uh, as, as I call it. They wanted to know perhaps much more. Uh, they also really wanted to gauge the intensity and depth of relations between India and Russia. Could India be actually moved from a stance? I, I think this was the prime purpose for which uh, most of these visits were made to India. And to understand also the potential that India possibly possessed to act as an interlocutor, to act as a someone, a conveyor of uh, the important message to uh, President Putin. So there were a range of things for which, uh, which emerged suddenly in this last few weeks, which uh, gave India a, a strategic fillip, should I say, to its uh, international image. One has to realize that uh, India is a middle power, mm -hmm. uh, a fairly strong middle power, now with a reasonably strong economy uh, and and uh, and, and uh, is res being respected at fairly high uh, fairly well I would say uh, economically you are seeing the visit the, the invitation to Prime Minister Modi to uh, come and attend the G7 visit and um, um, summit in in, in uh, Germany so these, these are all indicators of where India's position today lies. And that primarily is the reason for the sudden upsurge of interest which took place. Besides that, of course, the fact that the Raisina dialogue was also taking place at this time. And some of these leaders came to attend the Raisina dialogue, but many of them who preceded the Raisina dialogue actually came focused purely to come and be with India and understand India's thoughts. Um, I think uh, there is an expectation from India, that it will, and from perhaps from personally from Prime Minister Modi, who appears to have now enhanced his overall personal image uh, among in the international leadership, an expectation which is emerging that uh, he perhaps can play a much more proactive role in, uh, in influencing Russia, influencing President Putin, to look at a potential ceasefire, a potential withdrawal. Uh, from hostilities which are ongoing in Ukraine. Speaking of middle powers, uh, there was a very interesting editorial in, in the Indian Express written by uh, Sanjaya Paru, basically stating that, you know, being a middle power is not very easy, regardless of which country we are talking about. And you did mention in our conversation earlier that a lot of countries in Europe are effectively middle powers. So what my question to you is, especially after the Afghanistan debacle, a lot of countries which are reliant upon the United States for uh, protection, uh, a defense umbrella, so to speak, are extremely let down because the United States did not stand up for its allies. Uh, so do you think the West is slowly losing its grip on becoming a very reliant power on many of its allies and partners, including that of India? That's a, that's a very interesting question, and I, I have read this article um, also. And it's a very interesting article which came out uh, in the Indian Express by, by Mr. Sanjay Baru. Yes, he alludes to this fact that uh, the three big powers uh, in their own areas of interest create, or uh, in, in the space around them, create a fair amount of turbulence in the pursuit of their interests, into which uh, many of the middle powers are sucked in and perforce have to continue, you know, following the diktats of the, of the, of the big powers. He has particularly identified uh, some of the BRICS countries, leaving out China, Brazil, um, uh, South Africa, of course, the European countries, Germany, France, and UK, France and UK, of course, enjoy the dual advantage of also being permanent members of the United Nations Security Council and also being uh, a part of the big five as far as, as uh, uh, nuclear weapons is concerned. But uh, he alludes to this fact that there's a need for middle powers to be able to create their own space around them, 
to be able to be independent of the influences which inevitably are generated when big powers actually try and pursue their interests in particular areas. Well, this is an interesting observation, all right. But when it comes to the Indo-Pacific, for example, uh, there is an inevitable confrontation in the making between uh, China and the United States. And uh, you're finding a lot of middle powers are going to get sucked into this. Russia, which is a big power, will probably be remain on the side of China. But here you're finding all the European powers, the three major European powers, India, Australia to a very large extent, now also being counted as a middle power, Japan, all of them will be together as far as the United States is concerned. Now, this, this is a very, very dangerous kind of a thing which, which is developing. How can the middle powers uh, keep themselves out, outside this kind of a confrontation? I don't have any made answers for it, but I think this is what the world is, or this is what many of these powers are now attempting to seek. Look at different options, consult with each other, uh, have particular relationships, strong convergence of interests on trade, in economics, in energy security, in climate control, and things of that nature. So these are the particular issues which Mr. Sanjay Baru was, was alluding to. But uh, at the moment, I think we are at a very early stage. We are, India as a middle part is also just seeking its own space at the moment. As we go into the next phase of the development towards a potentially new world order, we will see much more of this emerging. And that's what we should be waiting for. And the hesitance is partly because, you know, the confrontation we are talking about is effectively with major powers like China and Russia. It's not Iraq or it's not Syria for that matter, where allies absolutely. were involved. Ab absolutely. That, that, is, that is right, because uh, our conf confrontation is primarily with China. Uh, and of course, Pakistan fits into it, not as a middle power or anything. It's just a coincidental thing that we have a regional conflict which is going on with them. With China, it's a much bigger issue. It's, a, it's an issue of, uh, well, competition. Competition for the kind of space. Pakistan is not a competitor for strategic space anywhere in Asia or even South Asia for that matter. With China, it is a different matter. Um, it is uh, very much existential because, uh, because China perceives India as a threat to Although India has never made any 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 gestures of or threatened China in any way, even our defensive military stance has always been more defensive, never never uh, very offensive. But China somehow has always had this little bit of a chip on its shoulder to perceive India or perhaps color paint India as some as a nation which is aggressive and has got an uh, aggressive interest. That is primarily more to more to keep India engaged on the continental borders in the north and prevent India from playing a more effective role in the maritime zone, which is where India's real strategic role can actually be played. So the Prime Minister received an overwhelming uh, uh, you know, reception in Germany. Uh, and if we were to take two parallels into account, both Germany and India depend on Russia on a number of things. India on defense and Germany on natural gas, and we've seen how that play out during the conflict as well. Uh, so, does this dependence uh, unite both these countries in some manner? Uh, very early to say that at the moment. I'm not sure Prime Minister Modi would have looked at it in this manner when he's undertaking a visit to Germany. Uh, in the last uh, four or five years, uh, the number of times that uh, Prime Minister Modi has had met Angela Merkel, for example, or visited uh, Berlin, has, has been quite profound. And this relationship has really been growing, independent of uh, India-EU relationship. Somehow, it seems, for example, I can, I can remind our viewers that Germany is the nation which perhaps uh, looked at India with a very, very positive eye Right after the after the World War, uh, after independence, India had gained independence. Some of the measures, for example, the funding of the Indian Institutes of Technology in India, very is hardly known that Germany had a, had a very major role to play in that. But despite that, as I mentioned in the beginning of my interventions here, 
that uh, our relationship somehow got uh, clouded by the Cold War. And uh, thereafter, when we came out in 1991, when we came out of the, clou- of, of the, of the uh, Cold War, somehow uh, it could not really take off. And although in the Indo-US relations uh, took off fairly quickly on the back of a lot of strong Indo-US military to military relationship. Here, Germany was still suffering from the hangovers of 1944-1945, and therefore the, there was no question of a military to military relationship to rely upon. Then it's only in 2000 that the that India and uh, Germany really started looking at how to uh, get their relationship going, and it, it 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 started going very well. Thereafter, tremendous convergence of interests. And in the last few years, we have particularly seen, see, Germany Germany is, um, first of all, a big, a fairly big economy, $3 trillion uh, economy. Uh, technology, one of the technological leaders of the of the world, right? Then it, uh, it's virtually a leader of Europe. Angela Merkel in the last, how many, third, how many, 17 years, was uh, virtually the leader, leader of Europe. And what are we depending on Europe for? Today, we are realizing that uh, there are many technologies which only Europe can provide us. Energy security. If you are not going to look at hydrocarbons in the future, which is a major, going to be a major problem soon, then this is the direction from which all your energy options are going to come. Clean fuels, green fuels, looking at hydrogen, for example, that's, a, that's another area which a lot of cooperation is going on between India uh, and, and Germany. Uh, on, on this whole aspect of uh, disaster risk resilience, right? Climate control. These are the domains that you cannot develop a relationship on the basis of this with any other big power or uh, middle power or anyone except these countries: France, Germany, uh, UK, and to a great extent, yes, I cannot forget these five uh, Nordic countries. Oh, where, 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 which, which, which actually should be our next point of discussion as to why Mr. Modi went to visit these these uh, Nordic countries the second time he attended an Indo-Nordic summit, uh, actually in Denmark, Denmark, with the four lady prime ministers coming from different parts uh, of the of the Nordic countries because these are the countries civilizationally very high with their values, very very high in technology. Uh, they are uh, great research, which goes on particularly in the weapons and arms and weapons industry, in um, uh, climate industry, on energy and things like that. These are the countries to go to. And we have not gone to them sufficiently. So I think this whole visit was about looking at countries with a different eye. This its issue had started to in 2018, I know, I'm aware for my research that Mr. Modi started looking at all these countries from 2018 onwards, but is now coming to a head. And I think the Ukrainian conflict or the Ukrainian crisis has actually triggered and engineered this whole thing by which a lot of interest is being taken in India and India therefore is simultaneously also taking that much interest back in Europe and its main countries. As far as Russia is concerned, I am not sure that because uh, we are both suffering from an energy deficit, Germany and and India, there are many other countries suffering a similar energy deficit. I am not sure if that is the prime reason. Uh, To my mind, the reasons I have brought out are the major reasons why this relationship is likely to sustain much stronger in the future. Thank you so much for that detailed answer, sir. Since you also touched upon climate control and related issues uh, that we discussed with the Nordic countries, uh, the Green Strategic Partnership was announced with Denmark. But the point of contention is always when it comes to the North South <coughs> continent, where even India and China, to a certain extent, are united in blaming the West for the industrial pollution levels. Uh, but beyond the political binaries that may exist in international relations, how how does the East and the West cooperate further on these issues for the sake of environmental security? Interesting question. And if you notice, actually, China has had a very strong relationship with the EU, economically particularly, right? And um, we have also had a strong relationship economically with China. But now, 
the European countries are all increasingly looking at the volatility which seems to be making itself quite evident in Chinese policies overall. Uh, the last two, three years in particular, the manner in which uh, um, the Chinese president has probably changed his stance, uh, particularly with the onset of the pandemic, and the kind of things which have happened against India, again, the Indo-Pacific, etc. I think the European countries have started realizing that uh, this kind of a relationship may not sustain itself. With the ambitions that China has, this may not be able to sustain itself. And therefore, it is important to have developed alternatives. India is the alternative which, which is emerging in everyone's eye. Right. Number one, it has the potential for, for fairly quick economic growth in the near future. The pandemic, unfortunately, came in the middle. Otherwise, uh, as promised, by 2025, we could have been heading to be a $5 trillion uh, economy. But uh, this realization has come that the pandemic is there. We'll overcome it now. Subsequently, um, we have a strong um, uh, political leadership. We have a reasonable amount of stability at the at the center. Everything which goes for a nation to make steady progress is all there, and that's one of the prime reasons why India is acting is becoming such an attraction for everyone, particularly Europe, because it is now being realized that we got stuck in the Cold War kind of syndrome for too long. Right. And in the recent past, once again, and particularly with this Ukrainian um, crisis going on, the potential of this whole Cold War syndrome returning and again creating a cleavage in the possibility of more cooperation between India and Europe would continue perhaps, would probably exist. And therefore, it was important to seize it even before it could manifest itself in any way in these relationships. And that's one of the prime reasons, I think, why the Europeans are looking at India with such a glad eye. Sir, thank you so much for joining me for this conversation. It's always enlightening to listen to you speak. And it's always an interesting discussion. Thank you for time and again extending this privilege and honor to me. Thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to be speaking to you always. Your questions are inevitably very, very incisive. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Namaste, Jayan. No, Namaste Jain.